G'day everyone, my name is James Dundon and today we're talking about DNA. And we're going to answer the fundamental question of what is DNA? Okay, so DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid and it's a molecule found in all living things, which is probably the most important molecule of all time. It is the molecule that determines me, you, and every other living thing out there. So we tend to refer to it as the textbook of life. It contains, within this molecule, the instructions to build a giraffe, a tree, bacteria, a spider, fish, apples, or even a bat. Everything. Living is controlled. Its growth, its function, um, the way it works, and some of its behaviours is all determined by this one molecule, DNA. So how does it work? Well, DNA is a molecule that basically has a repeating pattern to it. If we look at it here, you might be able to make out that it has this sort of uh, backbone and another one here, and it forms that famous double helix. Now, you've probably heard of that before, but to make it easier to see, here's a diagram of it. So, I like to think of it as a twisted ladder where the backbone is sort of the upright parts of the ladder and these what we call bases that form the middle or the runs of a ladder um, make this twisted um, ladder appearance. So what is it? Well basically DNA is a repeating sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate, sugar, phosphate with these bases attached and joined together from each side. And if we look at that we can see that we can actually store data this way because it, we have four unique bases. So these four unique bases are guanine, cytosine, arginine, and thymine. Now these four bases we can order in a specific sequence that then stores data. So for example, the sequence might be a, T, G, C, C, G, T, A, and that would be different than T, A, G, C, G, G, A, T, for example. So that sequence is really important in determining the characteristics of that organism. Okay, it's a way of storing data. So for example, in, if you're familiar with computers, we store data with ones and zeros. In life, we store it with four unique bases, a, T, G, and C, okay? And there's the written version, deoxyribonucleic acid, and if you needed to write that down, okay? So just to recap, we have this um, two strands, double strand, twisted, with these bases um, joining in the middle. And you might notice that only two letters pair with each other. A and T pair with each other, and G, and C pair with each other. You'll never see a G and a T, or an A and a C, for example, pairing together. It's always G and C, and A and T, okay? And this, by being two-stranded, double-stranded, actually helps with the stability of that molecule, so it doesn't break down. And obviously, with how important we know it is, it's very important that it doesn't break down. So if we look at this molecule, and we start to see um, the extent of it, and that it's just a repeating unit, how long does it need to be to code for a human? Well, I thought the best way to understand exactly how big that code is, which is inside just one cell, I thought I'd show a video by Riccardo Sabatini. Okay, so we're just going to play An amazing that scientist, a woman, took a picture of it, but it took us more than 40 years to finally poke inside a human cell, take out this crystal, unroll it, and read it for the first time. Well, the code comes out to be a fairly simple alphabet, four letters, A, T, C, and G. And to build a human, you need three billion of them. Three billion. How many are three billion? Well, we don't really make any sense as a number, right? So I was thinking how to ex I could explain myself better about how big and enormous is this code, but there is a 
I mean, I'm going to have some help, and the best person that is going to help me to introduce you the code is actually the first man in the sequence, Dr. Craig Venter. So welcome on stage, Dr. Craig Venter. Not the man in his flesh, but for the first time in history, this is the genome of a specific human printed page by page, letter by letter. 262,000 pages of information, 450 kilograms shipped from the United States to Canada, only thanks to Bruno Boding on stage, Lulu.com, a startup that did everything. It was an amazing feat. But this is the visual perception of what is the code of life. And now, for the first time, I can do something funny. I can actually poke inside it and read. So let me take uh, some interesting book uh, like this one. And I have an annotation. It's a fairly big book. So just to let you see what is the code of life. <laughs> thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of letters that may apparently make any sense. Let's get to a specific part. Let me read it to you. A A G A A T A T A. Well, to you, sounds mute letters, but this sequence gives the color of the eyes to Craig. Show you another part of the book. It's actually a little more complicated. Chromosome 14, book 132. <laughs> As you might expect. A T T C T T G A T T. This human is lucky, because if we will miss just two letters in this position, two letters over three billion, he will be condemned to a terrible disease, cystic fibrosis. We have no cure for it. We don't know how to solve it, and it's just two letters of difference for what we are. A wonderful book, a mighty book. A mighty book that helped me to understand and show you also something quite remarkable. Every one of you, what makes me me and you you, is just about five million of this, half a book. For the rest, we are all absolutely identical. 500 pages is the miracle of life that you are. The rest, we all share it. So think about again when we think we are different. I guess. This is so as you can see, it is massive. The amount of data that's stored inside the nucleus of one cell is huge. And it needs to be, I guess, because it has to code everything about us. Okay? And scientists are just finding out more and more details about that code and how it affects uh, people. Okay? And, what sort of, and you can see small changes or errors can have some really substantial effects. So if we dive into it in a little bit more detail, you can see, here's our sugar, here's our phosphate, and they repeat up the side. Now, if we take our sugar, our phosphate, and one of our bases, that forms what we call a nucleotide. Okay? So a nucleotide is the building blocks of DNA, you could say. Okay? We stack these together, and we get a sequence. If we look at that sugar carefully, you can see that it, in this section here, has just a hydrogen instead of an oxygen and a hydrogen, which is why we call it deoxyribonucleic acid, so it's missing one oxygen. So we have our sugar, our phosphate, our sugar, our phosphate, and attached to our sugar is a base. That base then bonds with hydrogen bonds, to the base on the other strand. Now that hydrogen bond is really important because it's weak. And as we'll learn later on, that weak hydrogen bond means it can break apart, and sometimes we want that. So for protein synthesis or DNA replication, we need those bonds to break so we can expose this particular sequence on one side. As we mentioned before, we have our A pairing always with T, with two bonds, and our C bonding with G with three bonds. 
And that three bond just makes DNA that are heavily CG a little bit more stable than ones that have a high percentage of AT, but not important to us, okay? Okay, so if we have a look at our sugar here, you'll notice that it's got this sort of, it looks like a crown with a little diamond on top, for example. Now, this shows the orientation of the sugar, which is sort of important to start looking at the molecule in more detail. Now, as we move around, we can see these carbons on the outside of the sugar. So we call these the first prime, second prime, third prime, fourth prime, and then the fifth prime carbons. Now they're just important to number so we can start looking at what joins to what. So on the first prime, we can see it joins to our base. So the first prime of the sugar, the carbon joins to our base. The second prime is where we look to determine whether it's deoxyribonucleic acid or just ribonucleic acid. So we're looking for that missing oxygen. On the third carbon is where we join to a phosphate, okay? And on the fifth carbon is where our sugar is actually, and brings a phosphate, okay? So this sugar, this sugar here brought this phosphate and then bonded to that third prime carbon of that sugar, okay? And so we actually build in this direction. So the new sugars are coming in from this direction and building down, okay? And on the other side, you'll notice it's in the opposite orientation. So here's our crown, okay? And then we would build down in that direction. So what you notice is down here, you'll notice this diagram has a three prime end and a five prime end. And that just shows the orientation of that particular strand. That can be important when you start uh, writing out the sequence. So if I write out a sequence here, it's going to be T, C, and I might write um, at the T end, I might write a little three prime, and then at the C end, I write a five prime, just to let the reader know the orientation of the DNA molecule. Now, if you have any more questions about that, um, please write them in the comments below and we can go through it in more detail, okay? Okay, so let's recap. Let's have a look at that molecule again. So what is it? Well, we remember that it's uh, double-stranded. Excuse my handwriting. Uh, it has um, four bases. It is missing an oxygen, which then makes it deoxy nucleic acid. We have four bases, arginine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. A with T, G with C. Um, they run in opposite directions, so we'll have one strand that runs five prime to three prime, and the opposite strand running five prime to three prime. That sequence of DNA determines every characteristic about an organism. And if we quickly draw it, we have uh, our sugar. So here's our sugar. Joined to our phosphate, joined to our base. Okay. And then that base will then be bonded to another base which then has its sugar with its phosphate and so on. And that is a hydrogen bond. Okay, so I'll just draw a couple more. So then a new phosphate, new sugar, another phosphate, another sugar, and we'll have a base. And let's actually give them something, T, A. So what's gonna be on the other side? Of course, A and T. And then, I can't draw these very well upside down, but I'll try. And there's the other side of our molecule. Three prime, five prime, three prime, five prime, and there's our DNA molecule, okay? So we always read just one side to get our sequence. 
Okay, so let's see how well you understood that. I've got a question here. Post your answer in the comments below and then I'll go through it in a next video. But the question is, if 30% of DNA molecule, if 30% of a DNA molecule is thymine, what percentage of that DNA molecule is cytosine? Okay, remember subscribe to my channel and I'll see you in the next video.